Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Bible University on the Dice Tower. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Catacombs, the third edition, game by Ryan Amos, Mark Kelsey, and Aaron West, and published by Elsra Corp. Hopefully you'll be able to play the game after watching this video. And now let's get to the table. Catacombs is a classic one versus many dungeon crawler with a modern dexterity twist. One player, the Overseer, controls the game while playing as the main antagonist, the Catacomb Lord, as well as controlling all of the enemies. All of the other players play as the heroes from the town of Stormtrine, delving deep into the catacombs in the hope of finding and defeating the Lord. In the game, players will control their heroes and minions with a flick of the finger. Flicking discs around the board controls the game's movement and combat, trying to hit their opponent's discs to harm or eliminate them. If the heroes can fight through a sequence of runes and ultimately kill the Catacomb Lord, they will win the game. Catacombs is a flexible game. The Overseer is both an adversary and a game master and can control the game in many different ways. Either by playing a brutally competitive game, attempting to win at all costs, or by tailoring the difficulty levels and a storyline to entertain the players, or even by leading the game as a full role-playing style of game with some flicking dexterity fun in between. As a result, the game offers a lot of different options and differing rules for various complexities. And to manage that in this video, we will split the video into several sections. First, we'll take you through the critical elements of setup required in all games. Second, we'll go through the core mechanics of the game. Third, we'll cover how to run through the full story of a game from start to end. And finally, we'll cover all of the specific types of shots, monsters, and other rules that come with the game. We'll be focusing only on rules and components that come with the base game of Catacombs. To set up, choose one player to be the Overseer, who takes the Overseer's board. That player chooses one of the Catacomb Lords to play during this game, and places the card in the top left space. Vasisak the Sorcerer is the easiest for your first game. Find the setup and the rules cards matching that Sorcerer and place them on these spaces. And place your health marker according to your Catacomb Lord's starting health. All other players will play the role of heroes, and regardless of the number of players, there will always be four heroes in play, so spread them out amongst the players. For each hero, place the hero card in the top left, and place its rules card in the second space. Like the Overseer, you'll place a health marker on your starting health space. Some heroes start with additional cards as shown on this rules card. For example, the Berserker starts with two Berserker Battle Axes. These extra cards can be found in the Items, Abilities, or Spells decks. Each hero starts with five gold coins, which you could also represent with one platinum coin. Find each hero's white disc, which will be used to represent them on the map. Also note any special rules that apply to the hero. The Overseer will lay out a number of room cards, usually eight or nine, which will represent the rooms in this campaign. Keep all of the other decks of cards nearby. I'll go through what these mean later on. You're now ready to set up your first room. The first step to playing any basic room is that the Overseer flips the next room card, and this shows you what monsters will be present in the room. On the table, you'll have set up a fence, which will catch pieces that fly off the mat during the game. Inside the fence, the Overseer places any one of the game's room maps. These can be a double-sided neoprene or a double-sided cardboard, depending on the edition of the game you have. Which one you choose does not matter. You can combine any mat with any card. Place one of the large cylindrical obstacles onto each of the obstacle icons. The heroes place their discs into their starting locations behind this line, and the Overseer sets up all of the monsters in any desired configuration behind this line. Play then proceeds in rounds, starting with the heroes and finishing with the Overseer. 
When it is the hero's turn, each hero takes a single turn and the heroes may act in any order. Once the heroes have taken their turns, the Overseer takes a turn with each monster that is still in play. Once again, the Overseer may choose the order in which the monsters act. After this, if there are any end of round effects, they resolve now, and then repeat with the heroes once again. This sequence continues until the end of the room. On a turn, a character takes a single action. There are four options. To take that character's basic shot, which is shown at the top of the character's rules card, or to use an ability, to use an item, or to use a spell. In all four cases, you are resolving a shot or shot sequence as shown on one of your cards. In general, your basic shot will be your least powerful, and your abilities, items, and spells will give you more elaborate shot sequences and more powerful combos. The most basic attacking shot in the game is the melee shot, represented by the fist. Flick your disc towards your enemies. Any enemy piece you hit suffers one damage. If you hit multiple enemies on the same flick, then each enemy hit suffers one damage. However, this does not count for ricochets, so if you hit a monster and that monster hits another monster, only the monster that you hit with your piece is damaged. There is no friendly fire in the game, so if you hit another piece that's on your side, no damage is suffered. Obstacles, of course, suffer no damage. At the end of a shot, any pieces which have left the playmat, if they're still alive, are returned at the same location they fell off. And if you ever finish a shot with a piece lying partially or fully on top of another, then move it down onto the playmat in the nearest empty space. What to do with a piece after it's been hit depends on its health. A monster with only one health is removed from the board. A monster with two health is first flipped over to its wounded side, and then, next time it's hit, removed from the board. And a character with more than two health loses one health, as tracked either on its monster card or player board. Anytime any monster is killed and removed from the board, it is placed onto the player board of the hero that killed it. This is to keep track of who has killed which enemies. If at any point a hero runs out of health, that hero is killed and its piece is removed from the board. But death is not permanent and the hero will return in the next room. The second most basic type of shot, represented by the arrows icon, is called a rush shot. A rush shot is very simply a single flick for movement either to try to get the hero into an advantageous position, or get them out of trouble. If a character does happen to hit another character during a rush shot, no damage occurs. The other most common basic type of shot is the missile shot, represented by this arrowhead. This is one of the game's many types of ranged shots, and so these rules I'm about to explain apply to all ranged shots. To execute the missile shot, take one of the missile discs and then place it near the character making the shot. The distance between the center of the character and the edge of the missile must be less than one inch, indicated by this ruler. Then flick the missile at the enemies without moving the character. Resolve any hits exactly as you would for a melee attack. And then finally, remove the missile piece from the board. All ranged shots are resolved in the same way, but using different ranged pieces instead of missiles. But more on those later. Some cards allow you only to resolve a single shot, while others offer a shot sequence. Anytime you have two symbols separated by this arrow marker, it means that you may, for a single turn, resolve both the first action, then the second one. Here, Elani's shot sequence would be one melee shot, followed by a rush. Shots with the elastic connector can be resolved in any order. So this bumble monster could resolve a rush shot, a melee shot, and a boulder shot in any desired order. Vertical or horizontal lines separate different options for shot sequence. So on a turn, the player playing the sorcerer could choose any one of these three shot sequences. Likewise, the armadillo familiar offers the left option or the right option. In some cases, a small box will be present within the shot sequence to clarify which items are grouped. 
Here, for example, the Flame Wraith could do a melee shot, or this two-shot sequence. While here, the Reaper resolves this icon, and then one of these two icons. These basic shots and shot sequences are all you truly need to understand the core of the game. We'll come back and describe all of the specific types of shots later on. Using all of these shots, you will resolve the sequence as described before, with all of the heroes acting first, and then all of the monsters. This continues until one of two things happens. Either all the heroes are dead, in which case the players lose the game. Or all the monsters are dead, in which case the heroes clear this room and will move on to the next. First, resolve the room. Each hero will have retained the markers from each enemy that it killed during that round. The hero gains gold for this, based on the amount of gold shown in the top right corner of that monster's reference card. So here, the elf would gain 8 gold. Gold does belong specifically to the hero that earned it, but, as we'll see later, heroes will be able to pull their gold for purchases. The overseer then flips and sets up the next room, and the sequence continues until all rooms have been explored. In this section, we will talk about items, abilities, and spells. Three types of cards which heroes will either begin with or acquire during the game to give them access to more valuable shot sequences. There are six slots on a hero board, and the icons showing in the top corner of them show what sort of cards can be placed there. Abilities go here, items or spells go here, and any of the three types of card can go here. These spaces are for your starting cards, and this space is reserved for poison, which we'll talk about later. Although there are only three spaces here, there is no limit to the number of cards that a hero may possess. The board is simply limited to this size for convenience, and because usually this will be enough spaces. As a hero's turn, the hero may resolve the shot sequence from an ability, an item, or a spell, instead of that character's basic shot sequence. However, since these are more powerful, there are limitations on its use. An ability may be used once per room, and once the sequence is resolved, flip it over to show that it's been used. This will be flipped back at the next room. Spells are single use for the game, and when a hero resolves a spell, the hero first does a rush shot, then the shot sequence on the spell card. The spell card is then discarded from the game. When resolving an item, there are three types of item, represented by these icons in the bottom right corner. If only one square is filled, then this is a single use item, and after using it, the item card is discarded from the game. An item showing two dark boxes is one use per room, and like an ability, it is flipped over once used, and will be flipped back at the start of the next room. And an item that shows three dark boxes is a permanent item, and its effect can be used on any turn. One special subclass of level 3 items are the familiars, and in fact in the base game, all four level 3 items are familiars. Each familiar is represented by a disc of its own, and there is a limit of one familiar per hero. At the beginning of a room, each familiar begins within one inch, of the character who controls it. Then, on a hero's turn, both the hero and its familiar will resolve their shot sequences, and the players can choose which order to do that in. Familiars have a limited amount of health and can be killed in battle, in which case they are removed from the board. But, like the heroes, familiars will return for the next room. If a hero with a familiar is ever killed, then that familiar comes off the board, and if a familiar ever kills an enemy, then the enemy token is simply returned to the box, rather than added to either the hero or familiar cards. In effect, no gold is gained for a familiar killing a monster. Items or spells may be weapons, magical, or neither. Some heroes are restricted from holding certain item types. For example, the wizard may hold no weapons, the barbarian can hold no spells, and the chicken can't hold either. He's just a chicken. 
Some of the strongest weapons are even limited to heroes who have above a threshold of starting health. This Berserker Battle Axe, for example, could go to the Barbarian, but not the Skeleton Explorer. Finally, do note that some items are more powerful in a certain hero's hands. In this case with the Enchanted Bow, the Elf has a stronger sequence than any other hero using the bow. Now that we know the core mechanics of the game, let's talk about how a full game runs from start to finish. We already know how to set up our characters, with one Catacomb Lord against four heroes. First, the Overseer needs to set up the Catacomb with rooms, and there are five types of room in the base game. Battle rooms of difficulty 0, 1 and 2. Four special rooms, which is where the heroes can heal or buy items between battles. And the Catacomb Lord's Lair, which is the final boss level. The Overseer can look through all of these cards and set up whatever sequence they want. But for your first game, a good balance is to take two level zero cards, two level one cards, three of the four special cards, and the Catacomb Lord's Lair. The Overseer sets these up in any order as desired, as long as the Catacomb Lord's Lair is last, and the battle rooms get increasingly more difficult through the game. The Overseer should layer the special rooms in a useful order for the heroes. These should be laid out in a column and the first one flipped. The card then shows you which monsters will be set up in this room. The card's four quadrants represent level 1, 2, 3 and 4 difficulty monsters. If the card shows a specific monster, then take that monster in that number. So here, four orcs, one troll and a pit viper. If the room shows question marks, then take your current lord's mercenary in the number shown. And the monster meter icon gives the overseer flexibility. The overseer chooses any one monster of the corresponding level and can then take up to as many tokens for that monster as there are in the game. So for example in the cavern of Torhak the overseer would take two mercenaries, a troll and a minotaur and could choose the level 3 ghoul bringing both of the game's ghouls into play. The Overseer takes all of the corresponding monster cards from the monster deck and keeps them either on the board or nearby for reference during this room. Then set up the new room as we described before. Take a new mat for each battle room you play. Set the obstacles onto the obstacle spaces. The hero players place their heroes and familiars into the starting area and the Overseer places the monsters into the monster half of the board. When choosing mats, monsters and rooms, it is the Overseer's opportunity to be thematic and tell a story. For example, there are five different classes of monster, and it can make sense to keep a class together in a certain room. And this room has a river running through it, so either tell the story of the swimming skeleton, or start him on land. This is where the story and dexterity elements of the game combine. Then play through the level according to the rules described earlier. Once the room is over, resolve gold as described before and move to the next room. If a hero dies in the midst of a room, then the following occurs. Discard all of that hero's gold and items and poison if applicable. Any abilities and spells are retained. Then at the start of the next room, the hero will return to life with half of its normal health rounded down. Remember that when you start a new battle room, any face down abilities or items are flipped back to their ready sides and any dead familiars are returned to the board. If a room is flipped and it is one of the game's special rooms, then this is an opportunity for the players to spend some gold on improvements. Although gold is owned by the individual heroes, Heroes can pool their gold in order to make purchases. There are four special rooms in the base game. Althea the Healer is a special room where players can heal. At a cost of three gold, a hero may heal one health. Both for this action and any other healing actions in the game, a hero cannot go above its starting health. 
At Is Chak the Merchant, shuffle and deal face up six item cards. Players may purchase any or all of these for the cost price shown in the top left corner. Players may draw further items at the cost of one gold per item. Players may also spend two gold for a map, which flips all of the game's remaining room cards face up for the heroes to see. The Alewife Tavern is a place where the heroes can go gambling. Place four heroes, four fire spirits, four centaurs and four orcs into a bag. And then, at a cost of two gold apiece, the heroes can draw three pieces from the bag at random. Depending on what was drawn, the heroes will gain rewards based on what's shown in this table on page 22 of the rulebook. The best results come from drawing three of a kind, especially three heroes. Finally, there is the Amaranth Inn, where the heroes can pay a collective eight gold for each player to gain one health. This includes above maximum health. Or the players could pay a collective eight gold for each player to gain one of these four specific items. Or one of the unused heroes is drawn at random and the heroes can pay a collective 10 gold to recruit that hero as an ally. I'll talk more about allies later in the video. When you enter the Catacomb Lord's Lair, you will add enemies to the board based on what's shown in the minion box of that Lord's setup card, as well as that Lord's disc. During this final battle, your sole aim is to kill the Lord. And once the Lord is dead, even if there are other enemies left on the map, the game is over and the heroes have won. The game ends in victory for the Overseer and defeat for the heroes if all heroes are ever killed or otherwise incapacitated in the same room. Now that we've spoken about how to play the game, we're going to go through all of the shots that are available in the base game of Catacombs. So far we've spoken about two of the four basic character shots, which are shots where the character is taking the action. These are the melee and the rush shot. Another character shot is bite, and bite is resolved exactly the same way as a standard melee shot, but will deal two base damage instead of one. Another character shot is the armadillo familiar's roll shot. To resolve this, tip the armadillo up on its side and then flick it in a roll. This causes two damage to a single enemy that it hits and causes no damage to any others if it hits more than one. Lay the attacker flat after the shot is finished. Additionally, we've also seen one of the basic ranged attacks, the missile, but there are three other basic ranged attacks, all of which are resolved in the same way. The fireball is the most similar to the missile, as it also does a single damage to any target it hits. The main difference is that the piece is larger, so it can knock other pieces around further. And as we'll see later, some characters are specifically immune to either missiles or fire. The giant fireball is a ranged attack which does two damage to anything it hits. And the boulder, the most powerful of all, does three damage. Next, we'll look at some advanced ranged attacks, starting with target. The player chooses a specific enemy to target, and this is the only enemy that may be hit from this shot. However, the player has two chances to hit with the same ranged piece. An ice shot, represented by the snowflake, is a shot which can be used to freeze opponents. Resolve the ranged attack as normal, and if a piece is hit, it becomes frozen. Place the token on top. If multiple enemy pieces are hit with the same ice shot, then the attacker chooses which one of them is frozen. The frozen character does not suffer any damage as a result of the ice shot. However, that character is not allowed to take another action until that token has been knocked off its top. This has to be done physically, so normally a teammate will attempt to shoot that character's chip out from underneath the ice. Once the ice has been knocked off the character, the token is removed from the board. If at any point only frozen monsters remain on the board, then it is the same as if all monsters have been killed and the room is passed. The players who launch those ice shots gain gold as if they'd killed the enemy. If all heroes are ever frozen, then the players lose the game. 
The last of the advanced ranged attacks is the Shield Shot, and this is available to some of the wizards and sorcerers in the game. When there is a Shield Shot inside a shot sequence, go through the following steps. First, pick up the Shield Token from wherever it is, either on or off the map, and place it to within an inch of the character making the shot. Then make a ranged shot as normal, but no damage is done by this shot. It simply moves pieces around. Then remove the shield from the board. Then complete any other shots in that shot sequence. And then finally place the shield back onto the board within one inch of the character. This now serves as protection for that character as long as they both remain in that position. Although this shield and the character can be moved around through the general effects of the game, the shield piece cannot be picked up and moved again until that shield shot is resolved once more. If a shield holder ever dies, then the shield is also removed from the board. All of the game's basic shots are represented by a white icon on a black circle. But if the icon is not white, or the circle is not black, then this is called a modified shot, and the base effect of this shot is modified. I'm now going to talk about all of the modified shots, but there is one golden rule which is applied across all of them. If you hit multiple targets with modified shot, all of the targets will suffer the base damage for that shot, but only one of your choice suffers the modified effect. The yellow icons are the chain modifier, and you'll often find this in long chains of melee or ranged attacks. This modifier means that you cannot cause damage to the same enemy on consecutive shots within the chain. In effect, it makes this long sequence of melee attacks less powerful, because you cannot simply land all four punches on the same enemy. When resolving a chain sequence, if you were to hit the same enemy on consecutive shots, then you would simply do no damage. The chain restriction only applies where there is a chain modifier. On this chain, for example, you would be allowed to hit the same monster twice in a row. Any chained ranged shots are separate shots both initiating from the starting character, not one missile that is flicked twice. The red modifier is a critical hit, which does one extra damage above base. The key difference between red melee and bite is that bite will do two damage to every target it hits, while red melee will do two damage to one target and one damage to the rest. A character who is hit by a blue modifier after suffering damage becomes stunned. The character covers the normal shot sequence with the stunned card and is not allowed to use abilities or items. While the character is stunned, a single rush shot is the only option for that character's turn. The exception is a hero with a familiar, who may still resolve the familiar's shot sequence in addition to the stunned rush shot. A character stops being stunned after being hit by a teammate with either a melee or rush shot. Being stunned is automatically healed when you go to a new room, and the last unstunned hero in a room cannot be stunned. You simply ignore the modified effect. The green modifier is poison, and in addition to taking any base damage, you will draw a number of poison cards based on the icon. A poison card is drawn at random from the poison deck and accumulated in this space on the bottom left of the player's board. Each card will be a number between 0 and 4. Poison is a second way to die in the game, and if the sum of all of your poison cards ever meets or exceeds your starting health, then your character dies. You'll also die if you need to draw a poison card and the deck is empty. There are several ways in the game to heal your poison. When the team visits the Althea the Healer room, then Collectively, the team may heal one poison for free at the start of the encounter. The players get to choose which card is healed. Further poison cards can be healed at a cost of two gold apiece. Healed poison is shuffled back into the poison deck. Poison may also be healed with a cure poison spell, or at the Alewife Tavern where any healing reward won from gambling can instead be used to cure poison. The pink modifier is regeneration, and 
if the player lands at least one damage with this shot, then the player who made the shot heals one damage, up to their starting health. The black icon on the white circle is the fear modifier, and after landing a hit with a fear attack, the attacker may make one rush shot with the defender's piece. In other words, the attacker can move the defender somewhere the defender does not want to be. The brown modifier is corrosion, and a player who is hit loses one item at random. If the player is out of items, they instead lose three coins, and if they're out of coins, there is no effect. The grey modifier is the petrify modifier, and this means that a target is instantly turned to stone and killed. Present only on Shagrila, the Gorgon Lord, you'll need to be very careful of this effect because it could kill your whole party quite quickly. Finally, the Transform modifier means that after the shot is complete, that monster turns into a different form. In the base game, this means the Fire Spirit turns into a Fire Wall, which is now a type of obstacle which deals one damage to the heroes when hit. It can never be destroyed, but it also no longer counts as a monster and doesn't need to be removed to finish the room. Some characters have defensive capabilities. This grey type of box here cancels out any incoming hits from that sort of attack. So, for example, if a zombie is hit by fire, it will suffer no damage. If a character nullifies a base attack, then it is safe against all modified and unmodified hits of that attack. If a character nullifies a modified attack, then it is specifically nullifying only that sort of modified attack. Base attacks in all of these types would still damage Marorg. Another type of defense shown by the mirror is the Reflect. Like the Nullify, Reflect will prevent incoming damage of the type shown, but it will also deal one point of damage back to the character that initiated the attack. All Reflects and Nullifies in the base game are permanent effects. However, in the expansions, there are some items or spells which need to be flipped or discarded in order to nullify an incoming attack. In a similar vein, certain rooms may suppress certain types of attack. Sometimes this is for thematic reasons. You can't launch an ice shot in the lava pools. When a room suppresses a modified effect, that sort of shot can still be launched and it will still deal its base damage. However, there will be no modified effect on top of it. An advanced type of item that a player may gain is a combo item, which shows a portion of a shot sequence. This can be tacked onto the start or end of any other shot sequence, allowing you to resolve effectively two shot sequences in a turn. For example, the elf could do a rush shot and a missile shot with the elven arrow, and then tack on a throwing axe for another missile shot to finish the turn. You may only use one combo item per turn. The next three shots are all movement shots. First, we have the teleport shot. When a character is teleported, it is removed from the board, wherever it is, and placed onto the teleported card. The teleported character remains there until its next turn, and can't interact with any other characters while on this card, making it a safe place to be. Then, on its next turn, its only allowable shot sequence is returned to the board, at anywhere on the edge, and do a single melee shot. As such, the teleport action is both a safe place to stay, and an easy way to get behind enemy lines. You cannot teleport yourself while you are frozen or stunned, but someone else can teleport you, which heals you of that ailment. In a similar vein, the runic shift shot allows the player to immediately move to any one of the runes printed on the board and then take a single melee shot. The other movement shot is the magic gate, which lets you swap two friendly characters, but doesn't let you take any additional shots. These three types of shot involve no flicking at all. The heal shot simply heals its caster by the number of pluses shown on the card. Heal All heals all players by exactly one health. And this icon allows the player to refresh an ability which has already been used in this room, making it available to use again. The bubbly icon showing a piece on it is the Summon Shot, 
and to resolve a summon shot, as long as that piece remains available in the game box, you bring it into play at a distance of one inch from the summoner, then resolve a single melee shot with the new piece, and then resolve the actual shot sequence of that piece. So here, summoning the liquid antient would result in a melee shot followed by two more chained melee shots. Antients are a special type of character of which Urtoth the Liquid Antient is the only one in the base game. It is invulnerable and not affected by any of the modifiers in the game. Control over an Antient passes between the heroes and the monsters on every turn. And so, when the heroes summon it, they get the summoning bonus and this effect, and then the monsters will get to fight back with the Antient on the very next turn. This makes them situational and potentially very dangerous for either player. Monsters which show a dashed line around the health are called shadows, and to kill a shadow, you must not just hit it, but knock it clean off the playmat. You cannot gain the bonus of a regeneration modifier when killing a shadow. A unique monster in the base game is the gelatinous cube, and this is a cube-shaped piece that you will flick through the game. The gelatinous cube rotates from round to round, having a different attack each turn. This includes the devour attack. On this attack, all targets who get hit will suffer one base damage, and then one target who is hit is devoured by the cube. Devoured characters may take no actions while they are inside the cube, but if the cube is ever killed, then those characters return to the board where the cube was covered in goo, but ready to fight again. Finally, it is important to note that the Lords are immune to all shot modifiers except for Chain, Critical, and Regeneration. They can never be frozen, nor devoured, and their shots are never suppressed by the room. With so many different shots and effects in the game, it's important that the Overseer, again serving as the Game Master, is familiar with what's going on, and plays a game that will remain fun for the heroes. As mentioned before, it is possible to recruit a new ally at the Amaranth Inn for 10 coins. This is a new hero to join your journey who fits somewhere between being a hero and a familiar. Set up the new ally as you would a hero at the start of the game, except it has one fewer ability than it would normally have. If it's a spellcaster, it starts with only two spells and its starting health is no higher than 4. This is tracked on your personal score sheet with the green ally tracker. Like a familiar, it acts either before or after the hero controlling it. It does not earn gold for killing enemies, but it is immune to devouring, poisoning, or stunning. If the controlling character ever dies, the ally remains alive and control passes to the player with the next least health. You can use healing spells or the healer's abilities to heal your ally's health, but not above its maximum of four. If an ally ever dies, it is dead and out of the game permanently. As a final variant, you can play with permanent death for your characters, rather than your characters coming back to life between rooms. When playing in this way, you can resurrect a hero at Althea the Healer for a cost of 10 gold. A resurrected hero comes back to life with two health, and, unlike in the other version, gets to keep all of its items. And that's how to play Catacombs 3rd Edition. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed this video, please help us by hitting that like button and subscribe to the Dice Tower if you haven't already done so. And finally, if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please write them in the comments section below. Until next time!